This video is brought to you by Surfshark. Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're looking at Mike Winger's response to the second and third of the so-called top atheist best arguments against God. I am putting this series on a playlist, so you can watch it from the beginning if you like, but I feel like these will be pretty self-contained, so if you missed part one, this one should still make sense to you. So without further ado, let's get on to the video! But first, a word from our sponsor, Surfshark. You know, I saw a video just the other day that explained how it is that hackers can collect information on you by pretending to be a public Wi-Fi network and snooping on the data sent between your device and the internet. It was shockingly easy and required very little in the way of specialized hardware. And that's why I never trust public Wi-Fi and always make sure to add an extra layer of security to my connection by using Surfshark VPN. Surfshark VPN is a virtual private network which creates an encrypted connection between you and their servers, routing all of your internet traffic through that connection in order to keep it private and secure. And with their Clean Web 2.0 features, you can automatically block ads, reject unwanted cookies without fumbling through the pop-up first, get alerts when a website was the target of a data breach, and block malware. Surfshark's extra layer of encryption makes it so that not even your internet service provider can snoop on you when you're browsing at home. Surfshark is easy to use and simple to install. It does not monitor, track, or store your data, and it works on phones, tablets, and laptops with no extra fees. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee so you can try it out completely risk-free. Vice Rhino listeners can get an exclusive Surfshark deal by entering promo code RHINO to get up to three additional months for free at surfshark.deals rhino. Again, that's surfshark.deals slash R-H-I-N-O and enter promo code RHINO at checkout to get three additional months for free. And remember, by signing up for Surfshark, you're helping to support my channel. Thank you. All right, let's look at number two. Number two is about indoctrination. And this is a quote also from Richard Dawkins. Second argument from Richard Dawkins. We'll, we'll then move on to other, other top atheists in his view. Do not indoctrinate your children. Teach them how to think for themselves, how to evaluate evidence, and how to disagree with you. I don't disagree with that statement. Kids should be allowed to disagree with their parents on matters that don't impact their immediate health and safety. But of course, as a parent, there are times when it is appropriate to run the household as a dictatorship, both because of practicality and because of health and safety. The kids aren't allowed to disagree with me about the importance of washing their hands after using the toilet, for example, no matter how much they may want to. Well, I mean, they're allowed to have a dissenting opinion about it, but their behavior in that case must conform to my opinion. And while I do try to explain the reasoning behind it, at the end of the day, whether I change their minds or not, doesn't matter. The hands get washed. It's, ba it's ultimately based on an assumption. I see an assumption here. It, that is, the assumption is, I don't know if you caught it, that, that there are two mutually exclusive options for parents. Either you teach them that a religion is true, or you teach them to think critically. Well, that's not entirely the case, but often what I've seen is that when critical thinking is taught in a religious household, the religion is usually the special exception. We can think critically about pretty much anything, but if you start to doubt the evidence for God or the resurrection or creation or whatever else, then that is when you just have to have faith. There are many atheists that I know where this disconnect is, at the very least, a part of what started them on the path to atheism. And the two are incompatible. You view religion through such lenses of bitterness, all religion, right? All religion. And there's plenty of people like this that feel the same way, that you can't reason carefully about it. Once again, we have Mike commenting on the internal lives of people that he disagrees with as though he actually has any insight there. Dismissing arguments against religion as just being the result of bitterness is a huge part of this whole you're allowed to think critically about anything as long as it doesn't call the religion into question thing. You aren't thinking critically about the arguments against your religion, you are being dismissive by attributing motivation to them that isn't necessarily there. Now, are there atheists that are bitter towards their former religions and potentially all religions? Sure, but that doesn't mean that religions don't engage in indoctrination. I'd actually wager that a good chunk of the bitterness that is there is a result of someone realizing that they had been indoctrinated and resenting the people responsible for it. Because here's the thing, if you convince me with data and evidence that your religion is true, I won't be bitter about my time spent as an atheist, I will be happy to have learned a true thing. As an atheist who is interested in science, nothing is more exciting to me than finding out that I was wrong about something. If I find out that I was wrong, that means I learned something new, and learning is fucking great. But as a Christian, learning new things could only be good if it either had nothing to do with Christianity or did not contradict Christianity. 
As soon as a doubt is expressed, fellow Christians get upset, dismissive, and sometimes go on the attack. And not too long ago, I responded to a different video that Mike had where he did exactly that to someone who was expressing doubts and asking Mike for help. Mike ended up questioning the person's sincerity in a way that, if it had happened to me when I was a believer, would have been incredibly hurtful and would have hastened my deconversion. He all but outright called the questioner a liar. If that person ends up as an atheist, then I completely understand why they might have bitterness towards a religion that caused the people who are supposed to help to instead attack them and call them a liar for having doubts in the first place. But guess what? That bitterness will not be what made them an atheist. In that specific case, it will be divine hiddenness. The fact that the Bible promises several times that if you sincerely seek God, he will reveal himself to you, and then after sincerely seeking God, there was no revelation. It's like if you've ever had someone you really hated, and then they did something very nice, and you had to find a reason why the nice thing was actually bad. I don't know that hate is the appropriate emotion there, but I certainly have experienced someone I don't like doing something admirable. While I may be more primed in such a case to look for ulterior motives, if the thing itself is admirable, I have no problem giving credit where it's due. And this is evidenced by the fact that I have, when I feel it is justified, given praise to apologetics organizations when they do something praiseworthy. For instance, in a video where I responded to an organization called Juice TV Network, I went out of my way to praise the fact that they have a video on their channel that I did not respond to, which explains that mental health care should not be stigmatized. It should be seen as the same as physical health care, and that included medication. There are medications that can help with certain mental health conditions, and these medications often have a very high stigma associated with them, and often that stigma is even higher in religious groups than in non-religious ones. I've experienced that myself. I take Vyvanse for ADHD, and I've had people in my comments on videos where I talk about it flat out tell me not to take it. Now, this hadn't happened yet when I made that video, but I appreciated that this apologetics organization advocated for science-based medical health care rather than engaging in the victim blaming that so many apologists resort to. And as an atheist, there is no reason for me not to praise praiseworthy things about people I disagree with. I don't have a book that says that all Christians are fools who do abominable deeds, there are none who do good. So when I see a Christian doing good, even if it's an apologist who I have very strong moral disagreements with, that's not an issue. I did the video and then I had an atheist respond to my video after asking me for it, where I condemned and condemned Steven Anderson. And the response was some popular atheist, I don't remember his name, doing a video explaining how Mike Winger might look like a good guy here, but just so you know, he's just as crazy as Steven Anderson. He's just the nicer looking version of crazy. Let's make sure we know he's still a villain. While Mike is saying that he doesn't remember who it was, I'm fairly certain that it's referring to a Prophet of Zod video on the topic. That was the only video I could find from it from any of the main atheist YouTubers that I'm aware of. And what's interesting is that Mike is framing this as though Zod had been asking him to make that video, and then after making the video, the very people who demanded it turned around and said, well, I still don't like him because he's a bad guy in these other ways. This has a couple of issues. First, I happen to know Zod, so I messaged him to ask if he has ever asked Winger to make such a video, and the answer was a fairly definitive no. So while it is entirely possible that he was getting comments asking for him to address Anderson, I feel like that probably would have been more from Christians wanting another Christian to put some distance between himself and Anderson, rather than atheists really wanting to know Winger's position regarding the biblical accuracy of Anderson's position. But yeah, who knows. Second, that summary was a complete misrepresentation of Zod's video. It wasn't, I don't like Mike, so I have to find a way to make him the villain even when he does something good. It was more along the lines of, both Winger and Anderson are using the Bible to justify their position, so why should something as important as should we exterminate LGBTQ people be left up to the interpretation of a book that could go either way, rather than just landing on don't do that out of a respect for basic human dignity? And that's the whole response, right? Like you can't, I, well, I can't do anything possibly positive. The supposedly positive thing that you're thinking of here is thinking that LGBTQ people are wicked sinners who deserve eternal torture, but you are against implementing the death penalty for them. So yeah, you don't get to be called a good boy and get a little pat on the hat for having such a shitty opinion, but drawing the line at extermination of a group of people you don't like, especially when you arrive at that conclusion from a perspective of, I don't think this 2000 year old book really wants us to exterminate them, but if I thought that it did, then I'd totally be on board. Is it possible to teach critical thinking and the truth of a religion? Yes, but best case scenario here, you're going to wind up raising a kid that has severe cognitive dissonance about it. Yes, why not? Well, to put it bluntly, 
Because applying critical thinking skills to a religion will, in my experience at least, leave you with no reason to believe that religion. Now, is there a religion out there that will stand up to critical examination that I just haven't heard of? It's possible, I guess. But every religious philosophy that I have heard of and examined for myself doesn't really cut the mustard. And specific to Christianity, there is no shortage of apologists admitting that the emotional reasons for believing are stronger than the logical ones. Learn to circumnavigate or go around the person's intellect, the place of argument, and to speak directly to their conscience. And I didn't want to resist. I had a hunger to give in to this. The Kalam cosmological argument, like, oh, that's a really good argument for God's existence, but I don't know how much it strikes people's emotions. I look at the moral argument and I go, ah, that one hits people's emotions and it's intellectually strong as well. Far from raising the bar or the epistemic standard that Christianity must meet to be believed, I, I lower it. Um, I think that this is a message which is so wonderful, so fantastic, that if there's any evidence that it's true, then it's worth believing in. The only reason why you could say it's not, why you would say this dichotomy exists, this mutually exclusive category of teach religion or teach critical thinking, why you could keep those apart is only if every religion is false and based on lies. Congratulations, Mike, you figured it out. Gold star. Yeah, so this is an instance of one of those things where, yes, every religion could be false, but not every religion could be true. But that's only true if atheism is true. Remember, he is ostensibly responding to an article written by an atheist here. He's supposed to be explaining the problems with the atheist arguments. To admit that the argument makes perfect sense and totally works if atheism is true doesn't exactly help you with that. Do you catch the circularity of this? What circularity? Through critical thinking, I have realized that atheism is true, so when raising my kids, I don't need to worry about teaching them to believe anything in particular about religion, I just need to teach them critical thinking skills, and then if they apply them properly, they'll arrive at the same conclusion as I have all on their own. That's not circular in the slightest. Now, I'm sure there are atheist parents out there who have just flat out told their kids that God doesn't exist, but as for me, I've done my best to go through the teach critical thinking route, and at least one of my kids has decided on their own that they don't believe in God. The other two I could see going either way, but given that the last time their grandmother took them to church, they said that they really enjoyed it because there were snacks, I feel like the critical thinking bit hasn't quite taken hold yet, but neither has a religious influence. They just go where their stomachs lead them. Not the best path to truth, but at least they won't go hungry on the way. If atheism's true, you have a choice to teach your kids critical thinking or religion. If atheism's not true, you can absolutely teach religion and critical thinking at the same time. Eh, here's the thing though. Kids aren't capable of critical thinking to the same degree as adults. Their limbic system develops well before the prefrontal cortex. The limbic system is the part of the brain that is more likely to respond to strong emotional stimuli. Fear, pleasure, anger, things like that. The prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that basically keeps the limbic system in check. Yes, eating this whole bag of chips is going to taste good now, but it's not going to help me stay healthy and I'll probably feel slightly sick for a while afterward, so I'll portion it out reasonably instead of eating straight from the bag and being done with it before I even notice. The limbic system develops much quicker than the prefrontal cortex, which for simplicity's sake we can say doesn't fully develop until around age 25, with the understanding that neuroscience is complicated and our brains never really fully develop. They are always capable of change and growth. Fully matured, let's say. That leaves the door open for continual development while still pointing out that there is a definite developmental point at which parts of the brain are not capable of performing optimally. So given that the part of the brain that responds strongly to emotional stimuli matures well before the part of the brain that keeps it in check, and that we just watched a montage of apologists talking about how important it is to appeal to emotions and apologetics, then it seems like the best way to make sure that kids are actually making decisions that are the result of critical thinking rather than being emotionally driven is to wait until they're adults before presenting them with such decisions. The best way to accomplish that, specific to this discussion, is to hold off on teaching them that a particular religion is true until they're in their mid 20s, while reinforcing critical thinking skills the entire time leading up to that. If there is a true religion out there, then it should easily withstand scrutiny at that point. But if a religion requires you to, say, train up a child in the way he should go so that when he is old he will not depart from it, rather than waiting until they're capable of critically evaluating religious claims, then that is evidence that that religion won't actually stand up to a critical evaluation of its claims. 
Now, indoctrination has different definitions. Here's one definition of indoctrination, and I'll put it on screen. Uh, teaching someone to fully accept the ideas, opinions, and beliefs of a particular group and not to consider the other ideas, opinions, and beliefs uh, or the ideas of other groups. That seems like a decent definition. And it's one that includes how Christian parents typically teach about religion. I doubt very much that Mike here would approve of Christian parents teaching their young kids to consider the possibility that Islam might be true, or Hinduism, or Buddhism, or even, heaven forbid, atheism. So don't even think about it. Just adopt it, believe what we're saying, don't think about or even consider other people's ideas. Now, if that's what you mean by indoctrination, then... Um, then that's something that happens on a human level. It's not a religious thing. Um, excuse me? Are you trying to claim that Christians encourage their kids to consider the possibility that Christianity might be wrong? Or are you just doing that thing where you're making excuses for the way Christian parents behave by saying, well, everybody's doing it? It certainly happens in an atheist community. Yeah, I'm not going to pretend that all atheist parents are like me. I'm sure there are some who teach their kids that there is no God rather than relying on them to come to that conclusion for themselves. But there's not a massive problem in North America of atheists kicking their kids out of the house for converting to Christianity. There is, however, quite a large problem with Christians kicking their kids out of the house for leaving Christianity or for being LGBTQ. I get messages from such people on a semi-regular basis, and my advice is always the same. If you're having a place to live is dependent on you being Christian, then just lie. Pretend to be a Christian until you can get out on your own. Yeah, it'll fucking suck, but better to live a lie for a few years than to end up in a desperate situation because of intolerant parents. Now, that's not the kind of advice that a Christian apologist will ever need to give to the child of atheist parents, and it honestly breaks my heart that there are kids that have to go through that. Where we won't even really consider the arguments of other people being presented. We'll just look for the quickest rebuttal and run away from them as quick as possible. Well, that is certainly how I lived as a Christian. After my doubts started, I had to actively avoid certain topics because the apologists didn't have good arguments backing up their claims. So rather than having to tolerate bad arguments being made on my side, I just avoided those subjects entirely. As an atheist, I probe my kids with questions when they bring up religion, letting them reason through it for themselves, encouraging them to figure out why it is that they believe what they believe. And I will love and support them no matter what conclusion they come to at the end of it, because I don't have a worldview that requires them to come to the same conclusion as me. You aren't even thinking. Like, you think you're thinking, but you're not. Do you know what this is, Mike? This is for you. This is a cell phone. Get it? Because it, cause it's a cell phone and it's a cell phone. Now, if you mean uh, by indoctrination, just teaching your kids things, yeah, we should all do indoctrination in that sense. But really, nowadays, most people mean something else by it. They mean kind of like thought control that prevents people from reasoning. And that I'm opposed to, which should be obvious. It should be, but it's not, Mike. It is very much not obvious. I literally watched you attack and gaslight one of your own viewers who asked you a sincere question hoping for a good answer, rather than considering the possibility that they might have sincerely had doubts about their faith as a result of God's hiddenness. Those are not behaviors that would be expected of someone who is against thought control that prevents people from reasoning. And by the way, Christian Christianity has had some of the greatest critical minds of all time. Right. And most of the great thinkers in the past have been religious people. I like how you had to pivot from Christianity had some of the greatest critical minds to most great thinkers of the past have been religious people. Probably because you know that when most people think of great thinkers of the past, they default to people like Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates, rather than people like Aquinas or Anselm. And given that much of Christian apologetics involves repackaging ancient Greek philosophy into a new Christian-friendly skin, that makes sense. But also, in the past, before we learned about just how powerful science was as a tool for understanding how the universe works, it made a lot more sense to believe in a god or gods keeping everything going. But today, among professional philosophers, 67% accept or lean towards atheism, with another 7% calling themselves agnostic, and only 19% saying they accept or lean towards theism. So the great thinkers of the time before science figured out how nature could do shit without a god believed in a god. But the great thinkers of today seem perfectly happy to, for the most part, leave god out of the equation altogether. He says the child will choose whether or not religion is true and real rather than constantly being told by trusted family and friends that it is. Kids don't choose what's true and real, right? None of us choose what's true and real because we believe in objective truth and objective reality, which means I'm discovering truth. I'm not choosing it. You're splitting hairs over nothing here. 
Obviously, that's meant to be choose what to believe is true and real, rather than choose what is actually true and real. Now, there are different kinds of truths, and apologists like to use that fact to cast shade on non-Christians thinking that truth is relative. But generally speaking, relative truth would be something more along the lines of your opinion about a movie. In my opinion, The Core is a fantastic movie. That is true for me, because I thoroughly enjoyed watching it. It may not be true for others, and considering it's 39% critic score and 34% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, I'm gonna go ahead and say confidently that my truth is not a universal truth in this instance. Though, to be fair, I loved it so much because of how bad it is. I laughed way harder at several scenes in the core than I've ever laughed at any intentionally funny movie. But when it comes to statements of fact about reality, while the perception of such facts can be confused by our imperfect senses, the facts themselves are objective. If God exists, then that would be an objective fact about reality. People could believe it to be true or believe it to be false, but their belief will not impact the actual truth value of the statement God exists. Now, Personally, my issue with the statement about choosing your beliefs is the idea that we choose our beliefs. I didn't choose to stop believing in God, but a thorough examination of the evidence left me unconvinced of God's existence, and so despite my best efforts to continue believing, I stopped believing. People cannot choose what they do or do not find convincing or compelling. That's why two people can look at the Kalam cosmological argument and come to two different conclusions, one thinking it's fantastic evidence for God, and the other wondering how things that begin to exist have causes even gets you to a God rather than just a sufficient cause. I believed in Christianity because I grew up with it and was emotionally invested in it. At no point in my life did any Christian encourage me to examine why I believed it. It was always just assumed to be true. And so when I finally got around to examining it, I found that the evidence was unconvincing. What those of us who advocate for raising your kids without indoctrination would want is for kids to be taught at a young age to examine their reasons for their beliefs rather than just assuming them to be true. And the more impact a belief has on your life, the more important it is that you know why you hold that belief. And if you don't have confidence that kids will be able to come to a belief in Christianity using this method without having to be told from a young age that it is true, then that is a rather severe indictment of Christianity in my opinion. And no, just for the record, I am not advocating for kids to be taught that atheism is true either. Now, if kids could choose what's true, indoctrination would be entirely appropriate. I could just tell you it's true, and then you choose it, and now it's true because you chose it. So all that would matter is getting people to choose things. I wonder if he's being obtuse on purpose, or if he really thinks that that's what's being said by the article. It's hard to tell. Mike is either extremely comfortable with lying, or his reading and listening comprehension skills are complete garbage. Because this isn't the first time I've seen him misunderstand something so obvious to such a severe degree. You don't get to choose what's true. It's, it's true or false, you want to discover it, we discover truth, we don't choose it. Well, I choose to believe that you just have garbage comprehension skills rather than that you are a liar. My choosing to believe that doesn't make it true, sure, you could be a liar, but that was still a belief that I chose. Huh, I guess you can sometimes choose your beliefs. But that said, evidence could change my mind here, and if I saw sufficient evidence, it would, whether I wanted it to or not. So the choice of belief is still not 100% mine. And that's why I'm a Christian, <laughs> and why I'm not a progressive Christian. <laughs> I hate gay people because I don't choose what's true. Isn't that funny? Gross, Mike. Especially considering the fact that the main cause of poor mental health outcomes among LGBTQ people is social stigma. As in, people like you laughing at how you're not a progressive Christian because you believe that being gay or trans is a sin. There is ample evidence that sexual orientation and gender identity both have biological causes. They are complex issues, so there's no gay or trans gene, but interaction of various genetic components, along with epigenetic factors like hormone exposure, largely program your sexual orientation and gender identity before you are even born. So it is a biological fact of reality that LGBTQ people exist. It is also a fact of reality that attempts to change gender identity or sexual orientation, that is, conversion therapy, are abject failures that result in poor mental health outcomes, including a significant increase in the risk of suicide attempts. 
In fact, conversion therapy outcomes are so terrible that it violates Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights and the International Rehabilitation Council for Torture Victims issued a report documenting the fact that conversion therapy amounts to torture. These are facts about reality, supported by mountains of data. And yet, you continue to consider just existing as an LGBTQ person to be a sin. Sure, you'll couch it in terms that make it sound like you're not specifically targeting them by saying things like, we're all sinful and wicked. But in order to hold the position that you do, you either have to deny reality, choosing to believe something that is demonstrably not true, or believe that God is the kind of cruel monster who would make someone LGBTQ and then condemn them to an eternity of torture for being exactly what he made them. Um, Frederick Nietzsche has a um, argument as well that the article provides. Uh, Frederick Wilhelm Nietzsche was a German philosopher, the article says, cultural critic, poet, philologist, and I don't remember what a philologist is. It's someone who studies the history of languages. Is that like a philosopher? I mean, the study of philo could be love, philosophy, I don't, wisdom, I don't know. Philo, love. Logos, words. Love of words. It was also used in ancient Greek literature as a jab at people who were overly verbose. You know, the kinds of people who would add unnecessary adverbs like overly to words that already adequately encapsulated what they were trying to say, like verbose. And Latin and Greek scholar whose work has exerted a profound influence on Western philosophy and modern intellectual history. And here's a quote from Frederick Nietzsche. I have not come to know atheism as a result of logical reasoning. Remember this, guys. I have not come to know atheism as a result of logical reasoning, and still less as an event of my life. So it's not experience and it's not reason. In me, it is a matter of instinct. Yeah, that's not the greatest quote that they could have used to make the point that they're trying to make with it. Worth mentioning here is that it was from a chapter in a book that Nietzsche wrote called, in English, Why I'm So Smart. The work as a whole is known as a self-celebrating and self-mocking autobiographical work. Now, let's put that quote in a bit of context and see if we can't make a bit more sense out of it. And I'd just like to note that this was originally written in German, and the English translation that I found is a bit different from that one, so that's why it doesn't quite match up. Quote, God, immortality of the soul, redemption beyond, all are terms that I paid no attention to, nor paid any time to, even as a child. Perhaps I was never childish enough for them. I don't know atheism at all as a result, still less as an event. I understand it by instinct. I'm too curious, too questionable, and too high-spirited to put up with a blunt answer. God is a rude answer, an indelicacy against us thinkers. Basically, even just a rude ban on us. You shouldn't think. I feel like the bit about logical reasoning was added in by someone who wanted to make the same point in a more concise, quotable way. I did pop through a few different translations, and most omit that part, but there was one that included it. After playing with the original German and Google Translate, I see no hint that the words logical reasoning should be there. Though I also don't speak German, so I could very well be wrong. The point he seems to have been making here is that he doesn't know atheism as a result of the examination of claims about ethereal, unfalsifiable things like God, the soul, the afterlife, etc. Nor is he an atheist because of the Christian movie trope of a dead cancer mom. Not specifically an example that he used, obviously, but I feel like he would appreciate the comparison at least a little. But rather, he is an atheist because answering a question with God puts a halt to figuring out what the real answer is. Instinct, in this sense, is not him saying that atheism is an instinctive part of being human. Rather, his instinct led him to be too curious to be satisfied with God as an answer to a question. Now, this is considered an argument now for atheism. And here's the argument. Atheism is instinctual. You are naturally atheists, and so, therefore, you should stay an atheist, because it's a natural thing. Well, that does seem to be the main thrust of the argument as this particular blogger is using it. But the real argument, if you actually look at the context of the quote, is that answering a question with God blocks further thinking and development of ideas on whatever subject the question is about. And it's important to keep in mind the self-deprecating nature of this particular work. If something seems to be exaggerated to the point of ridiculousness, it was probably done so intentionally. This is just a paragraph away, after all, from where he says that the German spirit of the old barbaric Germans was a result of indigestion from eating soup as an appetizer, boiled meats, and vegetables that were made fat and mealy. Now, in context, this was a metaphor about the quality of philosophers that he had read in his youth, but it's written in an overblown way. And as a side note, in the same metaphor he refers to English cuisine as a return to nature. That is, cannibalism. I'm actually quite enjoying this book. Let's read it. Atheism is completely natural. A primary tool of critical thought is to remember that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. 
bottom rung atheism guys. I like how he says that as though his saying that completely negates any point being made. And yes, it is a pithy quip that could do with more fleshing out, but if you actually take a moment to look into its meaning and origin, you'll find that that iteration of the quote came from Carl Sagan. Important to note here is that Sagan explicitly rejected the atheist label. So to call a Sagan quote, bottom rung atheism, suggests that Mike might just be engaging in bottom rung apologetics. But the astute among you might have noticed my use of the words that iteration of the quote. That's because Sagan didn't invent that principle. He was rephrasing a statement of Pierre-Simon Laplace, an 18th and 19th century French polymath whose work laid the groundwork for several fields of science, everything from engineering and math to physics, astronomy, and philosophy. The original quote was in French, but the English translation of it is, the weight of evidence for an extraordinary claim must be proportioned to its strangeness. But that's still not really the origin. This concept has been around for long enough that its actual origin remains uncertain. Similar statements have been recorded as far back as the early 1700s, seeming to originate with the Anglican vicar Benjamin Bailey, who said, these matters being very extraordinary will require a very extraordinary proof in 1708. So your bottom rung atheist argument actually originated with a vicar of the Anglican church. Another religious official, and one who I actually brought up a couple weeks ago, the abolitionist Anglican bishop Belby Porteus, gave a variation of this quote saying, miracles being very unusual and extraordinary facts, they require very strong evidence to support them. Philosopher David Hume is largely credited with being the first person to fully flesh out the concept as more than just a one-off statement. Do you consider Hume to be bottom rung atheism? or an Anglican bishop? And really, in looking into the number of people who have said this or something similar, it's mostly religious figures arguing against people claiming to have had direct revelation from God about the end times or something else of a prophetic nature. But modern apologists all seem to have a hard time with this. To quote Apologia, poetry must give way to pragmatism in order that theists can understand our meaning. He then rephrases it as claims of things I do not perceive as usual require evidence that has sufficient claim affirming properties to overcome my pre-evidential assessment in order for me to personally become convinced of said claim. This is a true statement about how people become convinced of claims, regardless of the nature of those claims. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with religion. In fact, the Sagan version of the quote was about the claim that extraterrestrials have been visiting Earth. I feel like Winger would agree that there is not sufficiently extraordinary evidence to support such a claim. So why does he scoff at the idea that non-Christians would use a similar metric in examining religious claims? When someone tells you that they saw a velociraptor in the forest, you're going to need evidence to believe them. I agree. Their claim is pretty extraordinary, so you would require some outstanding evidence for their claim. Well, I don't, know, I don't even know what outstanding means. I would require evidence for their claim. Well, in the context of this quote, you would need evidence that sufficiently points exclusively to the conclusion that there is a velociraptor in the forest in order to convince you. And remember, this is subjectively about convincing you, because evidence could be something like a fresh velociraptor footprint. But if you're not an expert in identifying dinosaur footprints, then such evidence is not likely going to be sufficient to convince you because you look at the footprint and you don't know what it is. And even if you could verify that it looks like a velociraptor footprint, that evidence does not point exclusively to the conclusion that a velociraptor is currently alive in the forest. It could also point to someone having faked the footprints or the footprints having been misidentified. A picture might be better evidence, but pictures can be faked, so it still doesn't exclusively point to that conclusion. In that instance, it's likely that seeing it for yourself will be the main piece of evidence that sufficiently points exclusively to that conclusion that it will be able to convince you. Now, there's nothing inherently extraordinary about seeing an animal in the forest. That's a rather mundane claim. The thing that makes it extraordinary is its relation to you. Seeing that animal specifically is not mundane, because it's believed with as much certainty as is possible in science to be extinct. And remember, this whole thing is in relation to having a goal of convincing someone of your claim. If the person who told you about the raptor in the woods didn't care whether or not you believe them, then they are not required to provide any evidence. So yeah, if you don't care whether or not I convert to Christianity, then you can claim whatever the hell you want about Christianity without providing a single lick of evidence. But if you actually want to convince me, then you need to bring evidence to the table that is sufficient to do so. And this is, unfortunately, a subjective metric. It will be different for each person. Someone who already believes that a god exists will have a lower threshold for believing the claim that this god raised his son from the dead than someone who does not believe that any god exists. Religion is treated the exact same way. If a Muslim man tries to convert you to Islam, you're going to need some evidence for his claims about the truth of his religion. Yeah, I agree. So far, he's just been agreeing with everything. Like, he called it bottom-rung atheism, but then he went on and agreed with it. 
that's an important point about religion, that the burden of proof is on them to prove their fanciful ideas. Well, that's also true, but it's also true of atheism. Atheism doesn't really have fanciful ideas. It's the answer to one single question. Do you believe that a god or gods exist? If the answer is no, then congratulations, you're an atheist. Now, there are implications of such an answer, and those can be examined in great philosophical detail, and there are philosophers who do just that, but trying to reverse the burden of proof by saying that atheists need to prove that there is no god is mainly a distraction from the fact that apologists don't seem to be confident that they have met their burden of proof. Also, for the record, I have defended the positive position that no god exists, with my definition of god being the god of the Bible, and that's actually kind of the crux of the problem of treating atheism as a positive claim. There are as many definitions of god as there are people who believe in god. It is functionally impossible to disprove all of them, because in order to to do so, one would have to sit down and get every person who believes in God to lay out a specific enough definition of the God that they believe in, in order to figure out what it would take to falsify their specific God. I believed in Christianity for a long time, and when I had the strongest doubts, now we're getting a mind uh, inside the mind of Sam as he was going through his doubts. When he had those strongest doubts, here's what he would do. He would remember that his parents, friends, fellow churchgoers, and extended family wouldn't lie to me, he says, about something so important. Yeah, I can sort of relate to that. You have a strong doubt, and when there doesn't seem to be any way to make sense of your doubts, you reassure yourself with the idea that either loved ones who taught you that religion is true wouldn't lie, or the idea that there are people out there who have done the investigative legwork and have learned that Christianity is true. So maybe I haven't personally found the compelling evidence yet, but other people have, so surely it's out there. And then when such a person investigates it for themselves, if they don't find the evidence to be all that compelling, then they're not likely to continue believing. Atheism is instinctual, but so is trust, which makes his entire argument self-refuting. We'll come back to that in a second. One is that atheism itself is like an instinctual natural thing. And the implication, he doesn't say it, the implication is that we should believe whatever comes naturally. You know, despite what I said earlier, I don't think that actually is the implication. And I'd also disagree that atheism comes naturally. In fact, as an atheist, I just have to look at the fact that most societies throughout most of history have had very strong beliefs about gods, which would then force me to conclude that theism is natural. There's even evolutionary explanations for how belief in the supernatural could have naturally evolved. For instance, the tiger in the grass example, where there would have been a selection pressure in our ancestors to attribute agency to things. If the grass moves and you believe it's just the wind, but it's actually a tiger stalking you, you're more likely to die when the tiger attacks you than if you think it might be something dangerous, so prepare yourself to deal with the danger. So to think that there is an agent causing things to happen will increase your chance of survival, and being wrong about there being an agent doesn't have negative impact. So over time, people who have a tendency to attribute agency to events that aren't necessarily caused by agents are more likely to survive and reproduce. And we know that our brains are wired to see agency where there is none, and that people who believe in God are more likely to attribute agency where there is none. So while this isn't an hypothesis that is strong enough to be considered the consensus viewpoint, it's also not a fringe idea. So yeah, as annoying as it is, a belief in God does appear to be closer to what one might call natural. But as you so astutely point out, something being a natural inclination for us to believe does not make it true or worth believing. The Notice the double standard. Atheism is supposed to be believed without reason or evidence. No, atheism is just the rejection of a claim. You say God exists. I say, I don't believe you. If you wish to convince me, you need to bring evidence to the table. You respond, morality proves that we get our morals from God. And I remain unconvinced because morality varies so greatly between individuals and cultures, and that would not be the case if there was an all-powerful source of absolute morality. I don't need to give you evidence to support the position of atheism, I just need to remain unconvinced of theism. Now sure, a case could be made for how, in philosophical circles, atheism is more likely to come as a positive position that makes the claim that there is no god, and this would, in a formal debate setting, come with the burden of proof. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about you, a Christian, wanting to save souls by convincing people of the truth of Christianity. Most atheists aren't concerned about convincing other people of the truth of atheism, so whether or not atheism technically comes with a burden of proof when speaking philosophically is irrelevant. At the end of the day, you want to convince them of the truth of your proposition, while they don't care one whit about convincing you of the truth of atheism. Now, it can be easy to lose track of this when spending time in atheist or apologetics online 
spaces, but those of us who are vocal about these things are in the minority. And even in these weird atheist online spaces, in my experience, the majority of atheists who are vocal in these spaces aren't actually all that concerned with convincing Christians to become atheists. It's more about convincing Christians to mind their own damn business. That's argument number three. Yet, we should only believe in God if we have, quote, extraordinary evidence. Yes. Or rather, evidence that has sufficient claim-affirming properties to overcome my pre-evidential assessment in order for me personally to become convinced of said claim. It would be helpful here if you could, you know, actually define the terms that you're using rather than relying on people's colloquial understanding. Okay, stop for a minute. This is like religious brainwashing to the max. How so? I'll believe something when you provide enough evidence to convince me of that thing. And that makes me brainwashed somehow? You should believe atheism with no evidence and without logical reasoning. No, you should reject theism until they provide evidence. Say agnostic if that makes you feel more comfortable, but ultimately, unless you're engaged in a discussion in an academic setting, such as a formal debate, then the rejection of theism is not itself a claim. It's just not being convinced of a claim. But you should only believe religion if you have extraordinary evidence whatever that is. Oh, I've told you what that is. And if you weren't stuck on the bottom rung of apologetics, you might have done some reading into the philosophical history of that phrase and figured out what it means for yourself instead of flailing around helplessly trying to word game your way out of having to support your position while having the expectation that other people are going to be convinced by your position. So is atheism instinctual? Probably not. Um, but what if we held that standard consistently and we said, you should only believe what comes natural? And who set that standard? It's certainly not being proposed by the author of the article you're reading. I'll agree that it's not a terribly well-written article, but at no point does he say that we should only believe what comes naturally. Well, we're going to believe all kinds of... Well, it's not that we're going to believe all kinds of weird things. It's that we're going to lose all kinds of important and true things that we do believe now. If we hold that, we believe what's instinctual, right? Whatever doesn't have to be trained, that's what I should believe. And now you're adding a weird definition of natural onto your assumption that they were saying that you should only believe what is natural. Training is a part of nature. It's basically just learning through feedback. I think that the current growth of atheism, the spike in growth of atheism that has happened recently is due to the promulgation of atheism in our universities as well as online. Yeah, as it turns out, when you expose people to ideas that conflict with your religion, then if your religion can't stand on its own merits, you'll wind up with more people leaving that religion. Funny how that works. Finally, let's come to the second issue. Does belief in God require extraordinary evidence? And again, I have a whole video on this with more detail, but let me just say the short answer is no. You just finished saying that you didn't know what is meant by extraordinary evidence. How can you definitively say that belief in Christianity does not take extraordinary evidence if you don't even know what extraordinary evidence is? And the reason is because you don't know what you mean by extraordinary evidence. I know what I mean. Evidence that sufficiently points exclusively to the conclusion of Christianity in order to convince me. Now, the specifics of exactly what sort of hypothetical evidence might meet that level of extraordinariness aren't exactly nailed down quite as well as Jesus on Passover weekend, but if you want to convince me, then you need to present me with the evidence so that I can then evaluate it for myself in order to see if I find it to be convincing. Complaining about definitions isn't going to accomplish that, and if you weren't a bottom-rung apologist, you might have been able to figure those definitions out by now so that such complaints would be unnecessary in the first place. If, hypothetically, Jesus existed 2,000 years ago, died on the cross, was buried in a tomb, rose from the dead, and he was physically alive. Let's pretend that happened historically. What kind of evidence, hypothetically, would you look back and expect to find? That's a huge key here that they always ignore. Expect to find when you look at the historical record. What sorts of evidence would you expect to find if it was true? No, we don't ignore that. And there are a few more details that impact what kind of evidence we'd expect to find that Mike's leaving out here. Because if this Jesus guy was just some dude and neither he nor anyone else really cared about convincing future people of his resurrection, then you'd expect to find pretty much what we have. No eyewitness testimony, stories written decades later by people who weren't there, no official records from the Romans, passing mentions about the beliefs of this guy's followers by a couple of historians writing, again, several decades after the fact at the least, you know, just generally the kind of stuff that would also be expected if he didn't actually come back from the dead, but some people from the time thought 
that he did. But if this Jesus guy is actually an omnipotent God who wants everyone to believe that he is God, and that he did come back from the dead, then we'd expect that God to, at a minimum, provide personal revelation of the basic facts of the religion to everyone himself without relying on the imperfect jumble mess of the Bible. We'd expect that the religion that worships him would be completely unified in message, because such a God wouldn't want such a message to become polluted by the ideas and mistakes of mere mortals. We'd expect Christians to have the healing powers that Jesus said they'd have. We'd expect that apologists wouldn't have to exist to explain why none of the expectations that we would have if Christianity were true are actually true. We would expect that a book that is the word of such a god would be completely incorruptible, not just inerrant, but impossible for errors to be introduced through the copying and translation process. And since the book that is the word of this god is perfect and incorruptible, we'd expect that supplementary books written by fallible humans would not be necessary to explain this perfect and incorruptible perfect message from God. That's just a small list of many pieces of evidence that we would expect to find if Christianity were actually true. And that's the problem with the extraordinary evidence claim. It's always irrational. In order to judge whether or not it's rational, you'd have to first know what is meant by extraordinary evidence, which you have conceded that you do not. Let's apply it to the Velociraptor scenario. He, he says, if you saw a Velociraptor, I would need outstanding evidence, he says. Well, I just need evidence, okay? Look, if you have video footage and I have reason to think it's not been tampered with. And what about that would not be extraordinary? Hypothetically excluding the idea that such a video could be faked, how exactly is authentic video footage of a velociraptor walking in a modern forest not extraordinary? And, and why do I expect video footage, pardon me, for the raptor but not for Jesus? Because there were no video cameras. Like, you don't expect video footage where there are no video cameras. Who asked for video footage anyway? I'm asking for no more than the Bible promises, a personal experience with God himself. The Bible says that this is something that you can expect if you sincerely seek it. When I was a Christian, I did sincerely seek it, and I was left hanging. But I mean, that aside, does the Bible not also say that all things are possible through God? Does all things not include somehow providing video footage of an important event? Why is that just dismissed as an obviously ridiculous expectation when it is, in fact, something that God could very easily do? This is kind of like thinking 101, right? Just normal thinking here. Thinking 101 according to Mike Winger. All things are possible through God, but video cameras in the first century are not a part of all things. The fact that human technology advances as humans make discoveries independent of any divine revelation is not exactly a great point in favor of the existence of an all-powerful, all-knowing God who loves human beings. You think he could have tipped the ancient Israelites off about germs at the very least. But I do, I have video evidence, or you could show me bones from the raptor, DNA, that shows that it's fresh. Again, that would be extraordinary evidence. Not because the existence of fresh bones or DNA is inherently extraordinary, but because they would be fresh bones or DNA that belong to a species that went extinct tens of millions of years ago. But also, such evidence, as mundane as it is, would have a number of hurdles to overcome. The overcoming of these hurdles is part of what makes it extraordinary. Because for starters, we haven't sequenced the Velociraptor genome, so how is it determined that this fresh DNA was actually Velociraptor DNA and not contamination from a modern organism? Were the bones confirmed? to actually be velociraptor bones and not bones that were misidentified from some other species? Have these findings been replicated? This actually reminds me of a tangent I went on when responding to Matt Powell. He brought up a triceratops horn that had an inordinately large amount of soft tissue in it, and claimed that the configuration of the tissue confirmed that it had drowned. The amount of soft tissue claimed to have been found was extraordinary, and if the finding had been genuine, this could have been a fairly earth-shattering paleontological discovery. But the discoverer of that fossil, Mark Armitage, notably not a paleontologist, would not allow other paleontologists to examine the find, only providing one picture of the fossil in situ, and that picture was partially obstructed. The fossil was broken apart in transit, and no pictures of the pieces positioned in a way that made it obvious how it had broken and that they were all pieces from the same fossil were ever provided and bison horns are frequently misidentified as triceratops horns. In this case, extraordinary evidence would mostly just be the exact same level of evidence that would be required to support conclusions of any fossil find. Identification by a relevant expert, examination by researchers from other institutions, rigorous documentation of the fossil in situ during transport and at the facility, replication of the findings of soft tissues, etc. All of that is pretty normal for a fossil to go through. But if the results that Armitage found were legit, then in light of the rest of the body of scientific knowledge about fossils and which animals existed when, then all the normal things that a fossil goes through when coming up with those results would be extraordinary evidence despite their mundane nature.
you could bring other eyewitnesses who have no apparent reason to lie about it? Yeah, no. No matter how adamant an eyewitness is about seeing a velociraptor in the woods, eyewitness testimony is some of the lowest quality evidence there is, even in the best of circumstances. It has proved to be relatively easy for researchers to provide cues that will alter subjects' memories, and in some cases create entirely new memories out of whole cloth. Add that to the fact that our senses are often unreliable, and we wind up with evidence that is subject to alteration that is undetectable to us, and based on potentially flawed observations to begin with. Even if I saw the velociraptor for myself, it would be more likely that I am hallucinating than that it actually is a velociraptor. If I was looking at it for myself, I'd still need confirmation that the others around me could see it as well, preferably something in the form of physical evidence. And seem to be confirming with slightly varied accounts of the same event to show that they're actually giving their own account. Okay, but what if the variations in the story are mutually exclusive? And actually, you're pretty obviously trying to equate this with the gospel accounts about Jesus, so let's make it line up a bit closer here. You aren't talking to an eyewitness. You're talking to someone who heard that someone else saw the raptor, at best. In reality, with the Gospels, it's a few more times removed than that, but let's just give it to them for argument's sake. So someone tells you that someone told them that they saw a velociraptor in the woods. Then you heard from another person that someone told them that they saw a velociraptor in the woods. And their accounts are different, which indicates that they didn't corroborate, so these must be independent accounts, right? Well, not quite. You see, if we're trying to keep this analogous, not only are these not eyewitness accounts, they are word-for-word -word copies of each other throughout a good chunk of the story. And since the Gospels were originally written in Greek, but the people that they are about would have spoken Aramaic, then these word-for-word -word copies are also translations. And remember how earlier we had the issue where different translations of Nietzsche's work ended up being worded differently? If the different sources for his book were identical, we would expect that they were all based on the same translation. The fact that they were different is what shows us that it was different people doing the translating. But for the Gospels, there are quotes of people talking where, if it was an actual event, the people would have been speaking Aramaic. But in the translation to Greek, the Gospel authors all wrote it down identically. So back to our analogy, the multiple people who spoke to supposed witnesses are telling you what they saw in English, but the witnesses told them in Spanish and they all say the exact same thing for most of the account. And then when it differs, it differs in ways that are incompatible. One says that at exactly 3 p.m. he saw the raptor eat a cow. Another says that at exactly 3 p.m. he saw the raptor chasing a police squad car through the forest. Assuming there is only one raptor in this scenario, it is not possible for them both to be correct. It is, however, quite possible that they are both incorrect, especially given the weakness of all the other evidence. Back in the day, we have textual evidence for Jesus. I'll grant for argument's sake that the textual evidence is enough to get you to the existence of a guy that the Jesus stories are based on, but it doesn't go any further than that. We have archaeological evidence. What kind of archaeological evidence? The best I've seen for archaeological evidence related to Jesus is that some of the places that were described in the Gospels have potentially been found, like Bethsaida. But the best that gets us is that the people who told the stories about Jesus were at least familiar with some of the places where Jesus was supposed to have gone. That says nothing about whether or not the things that Jesus was supposed to have done there actually happened. Now, I know that Mike will call this a bottom-rung atheist argument and dismiss it, but that is the equivalent of saying that the existence of New York City is evidence for Spider-Man. And not just Spider-Man's existence existence, but the existence of a godlike being known as the Beyonder who once started a cult called the Cosmic Oneness. Of course, the main problem with this comparison is that we know that the authors of the Spider-Man comics were writing fiction, and that's true, but the level of evidence remains the same nonetheless. For all we know, the Gospel authors were writing fiction. There is still scholarly debate as to what genre the Gospels even are, or whether they constitute a new genre that hadn't existed prior to their writing. Can we say for certain that they weren't intentionally writing fiction, when we can't even conclusively say what genre they were writing? There are aspects of Greco-Roman biography in the Gospels, but if we consider it to be that type of biography, we are then left with the problem that a Greco-Roman style biography was more concerned with displaying the main figure's core character traits, and if a story had to be just made up in order to do that, then that was fine. So if their biographies in that sense, then they might be true in the sense that they accurately represent the character traits of Jesus, but the details are not necessarily true. There are also aspects of traditional Jewish storytelling, with motifs surrounding God's acts of redemption towards his people, culminating in the greatest act that was the coming of the Messiah. But one of the things about motifs in a story is that they tend to indicate fiction. So again, we're left with the idea that even if there was a core historical element to the story, the motifs were written around this core element in a way that makes it almost certain that they are not true stories. 
And really, regardless of genre, there are stories that we know for a fact were not written until well after the Gospels were written. The story of the woman caught in adultery, for instance, that doesn't show up in any manuscript before the 5th century. It was likely written sometime before that in the late 2nd to early 3rd century, but this is still about a century after the book of John was written. The language used is very out of place for John and would have fit better in one of the Synoptic Gospels. In fact, some of the ancient scribes that were copying out these manuscripts agreed. There are some manuscripts where the story is instead put in the book of Luke. So did this story actually happen? Almost certainly not. It is so far removed from the time of the events, and it's so out of place, that it seems likely that there isn't even an historical core to this particular story. So all this to say that archaeological discoveries have confirmed that some of the people and places named in the Gospels were real, and rather than this being extraordinary evidence to support the claim that the Gospels are actually literally true, it's actually quite mundane. If the Gospels were literally true, then them being accurate about people and places would be a bare minimum expectation, as even the authors of fiction can get some details right. We have eyewitness evidence. No the fuck we do not. There is a grand total of one author of any of the New Testament books who claims to have seen Jesus for himself, and that is Paul, who didn't meet Jesus until after the resurrection, and who describes the experience in a way that makes it abundantly clear that it was a vision rather than a physical interaction. The Gospels are not written by eyewitnesses. They don't even pretend to be. Luke even pretty explicitly states at the beginning of his book that he is not an eyewitness, but is compiling the story from multiple sources. Now, he does claim to be working from eyewitness accounts himself, but he never names his sources, and he heavily copied word for word from the book of Mark, which not even church tradition tries to claim is an eyewitness account. At no point do we have anyone other than Paul even claim to have been an eyewitness to anything, and what Paul claims to have witnessed isn't a whole lot. And we have good historical and critical uh, research that goes and brings it all back to the first century, to the time of Christ. You just need normal evidence to prove any claim. Okay, but that's kind of what I'm getting at here. Your normal evidence is maybe enough to get you to the possibility that the stories of Jesus in the Bible were based on a real guy, and that's it. Even then, it's rather weak. Even if the Gospels were based on eyewitness testimony, the earliest was written some 40 years after Jesus would have died. Are you willing to claim that these books would have been completely accurate stories of what actually happened right down to word-for-word -word quotes of people in conversations, including conversations that the eyewitnesses couldn't possibly have witnessed? You know, like when Jesus was alone with Pilate. Just given how human memory works, it's basically impossible that books written 40 years later would have the degree of accuracy required to be called inerrant. Now, sure, you can appeal to God doing miracles to make sure they were inerrant, but this leaves us with two problems. First, it's really weird that he would perform such miracles to make sure the original documents were inerrant, and then would stop to allow errors to creep in as new copies were being made, and allow us to lose the originals altogether. Second, this would be another claim for which you would need to bring supporting evidence to the table, and I can't even think of what kind of evidence would actually support such a claim. So if I'm extremely generous with my assessment of the evidence, we have enough to support the idea that a religious leader named Jesus, well, actually Yeshua, and I'm rather fond of that joke about how Yeshua would have been better translated as Joshua, and that Christ means anointed one, and since anointing something is to rub it with oil, then his name in English is Oily Josh. So we have enough evidence to suggest that Oily Josh built up enough of a following to wind up on Rome's radar, Roman authorities had him executed, and some of his followers had experiences that they thought meant that Oily Josh had come back from the dead, hope the oil wasn't rancid, and managed to convince others of the same, leading to the beginnings of a new religion. And that's it. We don't get to a point where we are justified in believing in the truth of that religion, and we barely have any details about Oily Josh's life or ministry. Normal evidence. It just has to be good evidence, decent evidence. My god, Mike, how do you not see it? Normal evidence, it just has to be good evidence. In other words, it has to be evidence that has sufficient claim-affirming properties to overcome your pre-evidential assessment in order for you to personally become convinced of the claim. Extraordinary evidence. And also with the recognition that the quality of evidence required to overcome someone's pre-evidential assessment of the likelihood of a claim will be different for different people. Which should go without saying. If that weren't true, then I wouldn't have to make this video. Either I would still be a Christian because it met its burden of extraordinary evidence, or Mike would be an atheist because it had not. 
And oddly enough, he contradicts himself by saying atheism is instinctual, therefore you should believe it. But he also says trust is instinctual, but he wants you to reject that because it's an inconsistent standard. Don't trust those people. If I were to steel man this argument, I'd suggest that it's not saying that you should rely solely on your instincts when determining truth. Instead, it's pointing out that this dichotomy will lead to an internal conflict, where the stronger instinct, the trust of a child for the authority figures in their lives, will likely win. At no point in this article does he say that you should be an atheist because it is instinctual. He's just saying that it is, in fact, instinctual. If I had to guess, I'd actually say that they probably were writing this partly as a response to the claim that apologists often make, that humans have a natural inclination to believe in the supernatural, as nearly every culture that we are aware of on the planet has had religion or superstition in one form or another, which they claim is reason to believe that there's something to these inclinations to supernatural beliefs. I'm not saying you should, I'm just saying the standard here isn't consistent. It's not right. So the straw man of Christianity in argument number three to conclude it is that the only reason to be a Christian is because your parents, friends, and church say so. And by the way, my parents were not following Christ. My father was the first one to try to talk me out of my Christian faith. While I don't think the point was very well made in the article, you're not exactly steel manning the position. Yeah, sure, your dad may not have been Christian and tried to talk you out of your faith, but why did you become a Christian? Did you discover Christianity through reading the text and then examining the evidence for yourself, and only once you found enough evidence did you start believing in it? Did you receive direct revelation from God himself? Or were you maybe told about it by someone else? A friend, a pastor, a relative? Christianity seems to spread mostly, if not exclusively, through personal interaction. It doesn't spread academically. In fact, there are plenty of hardcore evangelical Christians out there that don't particularly care for the academic work surrounding Christianity. Being resistant to conclusions that they don't like, like that the Gospels weren't written by eyewitnesses, were written decades after the events they purport to describe, and that they were modified after the fact. Stuff like that. These are conclusions that have been reached by scholars who are mostly Christians themselves, working for Christian institutions. But these literal-minded evangelicals reject their conclusions, often painting these conclusions as lies meant to cause people to question their beliefs. So no, Christianity doesn't seem to spread academically. Neither does it spread through personal revelation. Never once in history has any group of people developed the religion of Christianity prior to the arrival of Christians. If God is personally revealing himself to everyone in a way that would cause them to become Christian if they weren't denying the truth in their unrighteousness, then the expectation would be that nearly every culture would develop Christianity independently. But the exact opposite is true. And this leaves personal interaction. You likely became a Christian because of a personal interaction that you had, probably with someone you trust, and it was probably an emotional experience rather than a data-driven one. And that's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from ScienceNerd7639, who says, Vice Rhino, I may have found a problem with the source that you are using here. It is my understanding that the author of this paper, Dan Grauer, has revised his opinion in light of new evidence. Looks like it is not really true that no more than 15% of the human genome can be functional. For more info on this, take a look at the video on creation myths, If Encode is Right, Then Evolution is Wrong, by Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal, an evolutionary biologist. You will want to look into this so you don't have this mistake in future videos. Thanks for the update, I appreciate it. I was unaware of this follow-up work. I have watched the recommended video now and read through the more recent paper, and indeed, an updated stance on my part is necessary here. Short rundown, my usual claim is that, according to a 2017 paper by Dr. Dan Grauer, when you mathematically model the human mutation rate and cross-reference it with how many babies we have, then 85% of our genome, at a minimum, must be non-functional in order for there to be enough space for mutations to happen without wiping out the population through rapidly increasing mutational load. Well, there was a 2020 follow-up paper by some researchers who disagreed. They ran their own model and found that when you account for the fact that a higher functional fraction of the genome will not only yield a large proportion of the population with severe deleterious mutations, but there will also be an increase in the expected maximum fitness for individual members of that population. The impact here is that it increases selection pressures, which will then work faster to weed out the deleterious mutations and fix the beneficial mutations in the population. This sort of balances things out. Yeah, more individuals will have bad mutations that could lead to extinction, but a handful of individuals will wind up with good mutations that work at the population level to balance out the impact of the bad mutations. So even with a high functional fraction of the genome, evolution still works. We've just wound up back at not knowing exactly how much of it is functional, but we figured out how evolution still works even if the functional fraction is high. And what makes this all the more significant is that Dr. Grauer, author of the first paper, was one of the peer reviewers on the second paper. He read it and recommended publication as is, which is one of the highest endorsements a scientist seeking publication can get. It is very rare for there to be no recommended changes. 
So remember how I said earlier that I enjoy being wrong because that means I get to learn something new? Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. I've just learned a new thing that is really cool and got to see the scientific method working exactly how it's supposed to work. That's amazing! Thanks for watching. Don't forget to go to surfshark.deal/rhino to get three free months added to your subscription. I'll be back next Friday with more, but if you need to get your Rhino fix in before then, I livestream with Surus every Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern, and with my partner every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern on my other channel, The Watering Hole. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and Sponsorships Manager, thanks to this week's PayPal hero Dougal, thanks to Andrew for buying the security cameras off my wish list for me, and thanks to the Haggis God for the amazing Rhino figurine that he sent me. This guy, right here. Pretty nifty. Pretty nifty. And since the postage on the package said that it originated in Kent, I felt it only fair to compose a thank you limerick. There was a kind person in Kent, from whom this rhino was sent. It fits up my bum with the ease of my thumb, but the sharp bits I'd give up for Lent. Yes, I know, I'm the next Shakespeare. You're welcome. Special thanks as always to my patrons, who are the instinct that tells you to watch my channel. If you'd like to know that just watching my videos is a thing you should do without quite knowing why, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com. That's where the Amazon wishlist is, and yes, someone did finally buy me a tablet! Which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my PO Box address is in the description. See you next time! Are you still a flying fox? No? Yeah. Yeah? I think this is echolocation.